5 to 11 servings of bread, cereal, or rice. What? 3 to 5 of vegetables and 4 of fruits. Is pst, their antioxidants and fiber help you to digest. Malaria is actually one of the biggest killers for human beings, has been for a long time. So malaria itself is very, very problematic. And we've often wondered why exactly malaria is, is around and what causes it. And for many years we believe that, for example, swamps, the bad air in swamps causes malaria. So the bad air, that was kind of one of our theories. And we also were kind of surprised that we could find malaria often in tropical areas. So these tropical areas of Africa and South America and South Asia is your main areas of, of malaria infection. We knew all these sort of facts, but we never tied it together. And we knew that malaria itself was obviously quite problematic. It caused severe fever, headaches, and different types of symptoms, which were really problematic. But again, we never really, for a long time, we didn't know what caused it and what was the problem, or what the actual disease, what, what it was in terms of the biology of it. And why I mention all this? Because the document itself says, students would gather and process information to trace historical development uh, and of our understanding of the cause and prevention of malaria. So we have to talk about the historical developments of the cause and prevention of malaria, or the increase of understanding of the cause and the prevention of malaria. So first, let's go through what malaria actually is, just in a nutshell. We have a pathogen, which is called the plasmodium, plasmodium pathogen, and this is an example of a protozoa. This is a protozoa. Now, with these, what actually happens is they have two stages of development. First stage of development, where they're still like very, very Im immature in terms of not well-developed. First has to happen inside an actual mosquito. So it becomes a bit more mature in the mosquito. And then the second stage of development happens inside a human body. So there's two parts to the life cycle of the plasmodium pathogen. So it develops in the gut of a mosquito. And what does mosquitoes do? Well, mosquitoes you will usually find human beings in many cases, other animals as well, but human beings included. And what they will do is they will suck their blood. And by doing so, they will actually have these slightly more mature by the time they suck the blood, slightly more mature early forms of the plasmodium and actually inject it with Whilst they're sucking, they also inject, you can see these small here, these, they're called the sporozytes. They will inject them into our body, into our blood. And once that happens, they will actually invade. So these small sporozytes will now invade our red blood cells. And they actually develop the second phase, that second phase of development happens inside the red blood cells. So they will be there for a while and eventually you're going to have your adult ones being, being born. So here you can see a red blood cell bursts. And we have the adult ones being born. And then we have a mosquito. A different mosquito will come and suck our blood. And while it's doing so, they will also suck in some of these mature ones, which will lay their eggs in the mosquito. And the whole cycle starts again. So that's how it can be passed from human to human as well, through these mosquitoes. And the mosquitoes aren't the disease themselves. They are not the pathogen but they're called the vector because they transmit the actual pathogen from one to another. Right? You don't need to remember all this. This was just malaria in a nutshell. Right? You should remember the mosquito was a vector and the plasmodium was the actual pathogen and the plasmodium is a protozoa, which we covered in the last video. Now, the actual document says we should need to trace the historical developments of our understanding of the cause and prevention of malaria. So what I'll do first, I'll quickly talk about the historical developments of the cause of malaria. Uh, so first, before 1800s, or so pre-1800s, we knew about malaria. A lot of people were dying about, from malaria, but we didn't really know what was the cause. So for example, some people had the idea that there were demons which gave people malaria. Other people were convinced that it was, they knew that malaria was really common and close to swamps. So it must be the swamp air that caused people to get malaria. Again, this was before the idea of Lat Louis Pasteur, before people realized that it was something quite microscopic which could cause disease. We just had these ideas which were obviously not based in, on science, but could be understandable because people didn't know much back, back then in terms of disease itself. But then came Louis Pasteur, and obviously his ideas revolutionized science. 
And because of his, uh, his ideas, someone called Charles Laveron, and you should actually remember that name, so Charles Laveron, in 1880, he thought about the idea that there might be a germ which causes this disease. So he discovered, he looked at people who had malaria and, and looked if they could find certain links between a pathogen and the disease. And he found that everyone with malaria had this protozoa in it. And the protozoa, what he called plasmodium. So here we now realize, okay, plasmodium causes malaria. He actually won the Nobel Prize for that discovery. But we still didn't really realize how to go from person to person, so what transmitted Now, in the 1880s, Charles Laveron just realized plasmodium causes malaria. We don't know how it travels from person to person. And that was when Ronald Ross came around. Ronald Ross came just a few years later, about 20 years later, so in 1897. Again, this is a name you need to remember, so you remember Charles Laveron and remember Ronald Ross. Ronald Ross came after Charles Laveron, and he was trying to find out how they actually get transmitted, so how malaria is transmitted from person to person. He didn't, by then, he knew plasmodium caused disease, but he didn't know how it gets sent from person to person. So he made the link between mosquitoes and plasmodium. The mosquitoes were the things which were actually transmitting it, and thereby the mosquito was the vector. And he could prove as well, he proved it with birds. He, sh he didn't want, he didn't test on humans, I think. He tested on birds, but he could show that you could get from one bird, you could give the other bird the same disease using mosquitoes. And that was in 1897. So after 1897, we knew what the actual pathogen was, which was plasmodium, and we knew how, what, how it went from person to person, which was the mosquito vector. So that's the cause, the development of the cause, the three main parts you know. Before 1800s, we had no idea really. Afterwards came Charles Averon, and he realized that the plasmodium was causing disease. And then Ronald Ross linked the mosquito to it being transmitted from person to person. That was the first part, and then it says we need to talk about the prevention as well, so the prevention of malaria. So we're talking about the historical developments of, pre of the prevention of malaria. So before the 1800s, it was more or less a hit and a miss. We didn't really know much about malaria, so we didn't really know how to prevent it. There were some attempts to use uh, medication, which was to a degree useful and worked. And people were encouraging other people to stay away from swamps because they thought the swamp air was causing disease, which also indirectly helped because obviously close to swamps are mosquitoes, so if they stay away from swamps, they would also stay away from mosquitoes. But overall, we didn't really have any good way of preventing malaria. But after the discoveries made by Charles Laveron and Ronald Ross, a few things happened. And there were three main ways, and you should remember these three ways and how effective they were. There's been three main ways we've tried to get malaria under control, to prevent malaria from happening. The first one was ways to actually kill Plasmodium bacteria, uh, not the bacteria, but was a protozoa. So don't, it's not a bacteria, it's a protozoa. So we tried to have ways that we could kill the plasmodium protozoa. And we, for now, for a long time, we use chloroquinin, which is a medicine we take, and that's, that's designed to kill plasmodium. And that worked for a while, but the problem is with many different medications, is eventually the plasmodium protozoa developed antibody resistant. So it would develop resistant to the medication and it became less and less effective. So overall, killing plasmodium protozoa, being one way to try to prevent malaria, has been not that effective because whenever we developed a medicine, they've become resistant to it. So effectiveness is not that high. The second way was, I mean, you can summarize it by saying, don't get stung. Right? So how do we make sure we don't get malaria? By not getting stung. And there's a couple of ways we try to make sure that doesn't happen. First, we try to drain the swamps. Now, why would we do that? Well, the, the actual mosquitoes breed in swamps. That's where they need still water. So if we remove, remove the swamps, the idea is if we remove the swamps, then we remove the actual mosquitoes as well. And then if there's no mosquitoes, there's no vectors, which means we don't get a disease. That worked to a degree. It did actually work, but it's still not perfect. We also told people to sleep in those mosquito nets and use sprays to try to keep the mosquitoes away. And it's still a very popular way to try to reduce the chance of getting malaria. And obviously another way was directly to kill mosquitoes. But for example, for a while we used the anti-pesticide DDT, but that has been banned since because it's found to be problematic. And overall, if we try to use poison against mosquitoes, there's always going to be some which are resistant to it, which means it's still not effective. 
So overall, don't get stung mentality of trying to prevent it is probably not super effective, but it's probably still the most effective way we've got because the plasmodium killing medicine is just not that effective it gets, because the plasmodium gets resistant to it. And the other third one was developing vaccines, and we haven't been able to develop a vaccine yet. So that's still ineffective at the moment. We haven't gotten one. We haven't gotten a way to complete control yet. But that's what we're trying to work on. We're trying to get one. And once that happens, once we have a vaccine, then we might be able to actually prevent it completely. But at the moment, we don't have it. So at the moment, the most effective way of trying to prevent malaria is through that second step, through the idea of trying, trying to not get stung by draining swarms, using nets and sprays to keep them away, and sometimes trying to kill the mosquitoes. That's still the most effective, while still not being perfectly effective. Killing the plasmodium uh, protozoan has been found to be not that effective because they've become resistant quite quickly. And at the moment, our vaccines are not effective. But hopefully one day they will be effective, which means we can remove malaria in total, in general. So I go over the top one again. It says, trace the historical developments of the, our understanding of the cause and prevention of malaria. Before the 1800s, we had no idea what caused it. We had these ideas, maybe the bad swamp bear, maybe demons. Afterwards came Charles Leveron, who discovered that malaria was actually caused by protozoa that we call plasmodium. Then came Ronald Ross a couple of years later, and he linked the mosquitoes at the, as a vector that gave other people the plasmodium. So now we have the pathogen and the mode of transmission that happened within 20 years. After that, we came up with the ideas of how to prevent it. So after Ross's discovery, we realized, okay, we can try to kill the plasmodium protozoa. That worked for a while using chloroquine, but then it became resistant, and now it's less effective. The other idea was just try not to get stung by, for example, draining swamps, which means we can't get stung by mosquitoes because they would be dead. That worked for a while, but still not super effective. We would try to get use insect sprays to keep them away from us and use sleeping nets to make sure they don't bite us when we sleep. Again, moderately effective, not super effective, but still a bit effective. And we try to kill mosquitoes using poison, which also hasn't been that effective because they become resistant. And the last one was developing vaccines. At the moment, ineffective. We don't have vaccines yet. But we're hoping that we have vaccines soon. So those were the main ideas you should remember. You should remember the developments in terms of the cause and the prevention. I hope that was useful. Thank you for watching.